Well, today we're going to get into chapter 22 of the book of Deuteronomy. So this chapter is a pretty interesting, dealing with sexual immorality. So a couple of things we're going to be learning here uh, that's uh, pretty interesting, how they're applying some of these laws that Moses is reminding them of. So in here, Moses sets forth pertaining laws of lost property, uh, wearing of proper clothes, caring of interests of others, marrying virgins, and sexual immorality. So verse 1, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it into thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. In like manner thou shalt do with his ass, and shall do with his raiment, and with all lost things of thy brother, uh, which he hath lost, and thou hast found, thou shalt do likewise, thou mayest not hide thyself. So what they're saying here basically is, if you find somebody else's property, uh, you shouldn't just walk by it and ignore it. That's hide thyself from it. Basically, they're saying, oh, don't just, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. And, and, and then pretend like you didn't know it was there. If you see somebody else's property, like it's, it's out there, no one's claiming it, no one else is around. It's, it's lost essentially. Like if animals get out, uh, or if somebody drops their stuff, uh, it's your job to find the owner of it. So you take it and you try to find the owner. If you don't know who the owner is or don't know where they are, then what you do is hold on to it until you find them. Then you give it back to them as soon as you know who they are. So this is what you do, how you're dealing with lost property. <clears throat> Again, it's not, oh, look, somebody's missing their animals. I'm just going to take them and put them into my flock and then they're going to be mine now. Or I, somebody drops something, I'm going to pick it up and then keep it. So it's not a finder's keeper's uh, principle in Israel, basically. Okay, verse 4. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. So again, somebody needs help. You don't just close your eyes and walk by or just ignore them. You help them. You should help them. Verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, this is really a, a, a interesting principle here. What, what uh, Moses is talking about is a woman wearing men's clothes or men wearing, wearing women's clothes. That was forbidden. You don't change. You don't wear the clothes of the other gender, basically. Uh, so no cross-dressing. No, you know, goofing around in other people's clothes, things like that. You wear the clothes that you're supposed to wear, and they wear the clothes they're supposed to wear, and you don't mix it, basically. Uh, that was an abomination unto the Lord. So I think having a more, uh, you know, like, um, well, cross-dressing and other things, not to mention like a unisex type society is not something that, uh, that God wanted for Israel. Verse 6, if a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young. So this is again talking about if the mother's on those eggs, you don't mess with them, basically. Uh, verse 7, but thou shalt take in any wise, thou shalt in any wise let the dam go. And take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest prolong thy days. So you don't take the mother bird with you, basically, is uh, what that's talking about. So if the eggs are there, oh, look, we found some eggs. We can use those to eat. But if the mother's with the eggs, don't take the mother, basically. Verse 8, when thou buildest a new house... Then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, if that, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from thence. So this rule, a battlement, basically, is when, uh, uh, well, let me, let me read you this section. This is uh, Clark's Bible commentary. He says, houses in the east are in general built with flat roofs, and on them men walk to enjoy the fresh air, converse together, sleep, etc., 
<clears throat> it was therefore necessary to have a sort of battlement or balustrade to prevent persons from falling off. If a man neglected to make a sufficient defense against such accidents and the death of another was occasioned by it, the owner of the house must be considered in the light of a murderer. So flat roofs, so people would, would walk up there and you could hang out on the roof, basically. Uh, if you did not put a proper fence around it to prevent people from falling off, then the owner of the house was guilty of negligent homicide, basically. So your negligence, failure to protect your guests, and uh, means you, you would be punished. Okay, verse 9, Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seed, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. So not uh, diverse seed, you know, a, a whole lot of different types of seeds and things. You need to uh, be careful with that. Verse 10, thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Well, that's an interesting one. You can't have an ox and a, and, a, and a donkey, basically, together while you're plowing. Probably because they would annoy each other. and You'd probably end up with a problem anyways. So keeping them the same, uh, you know, have two oxes or two asses or whatever. They, you know, the ox and the ass probably cause problems for each other. So... Uh, verse 11, thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. So diverse doesn't mean people who scuba dive. Diverse means like diversity, uh, like a whole lot of different types of things out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, verse 12, thou shalt make the fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture, vesture wherewith thou coverest thyself. So this is on your some of your clothing. You have fringes on the corners. Some of this goes into, if you remember back when we talked about the remember, remembering the law and using like tassels and using frilly stuff on the ends of your garments to help with remembering the law, that part of that was a fringe that you would put on there to remind yourself of them. Uh, so that probably goes along with that. Now, verse 13, if any man take a wife, and go in unto her, and hate her, and give occasions of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her, and say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid, meaning a virgin. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. Now, this is this is the tokens of the damsel's virginity uh, is basically, um, it, so it's not necessarily evidence of a woman's virginity. It's more of a, like a, a sign that they've promised not to have intercourse or anything, basically, or they can say, yes, I have covenant to, to not do this, kind of a thing to show that, yes, look, she is uh, a virgin. She has said that she, this is what, what she's going to do. Uh, let's see. Verse uh, 17, And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. So here is, this is this is an important thing to look at, is um, when we're considering this, this is uh, talking about basically a woman who gets married um, and she... They go, so they go get married, okay, uh, and the they they go to to have intercourse with each other. Uh, I'm trying to be careful how I phrase these things, and uh, they are the guy, the husband does not believe that these are um, that his wife is a virgin. So he, he gets married. This guy gets married. Thinking, oh, I've got this beautiful woman. She's a virgin. This is great, wonderful wife. They go to have intercourse, and he goes, wait a minute, she's not a virgin. 
So this is, um, but now he's accusing her of this. So if, if he's falsely accusing her of this, then the father and mother of that woman can then come to her defense and prove that she is a virgin. So actually, let me give you this uh, quote here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the word used in verses 14 through 17 and 18 is batulim, evidences of virginity. This is from batula, virgin, which is used in verse 19 to describe a woman thus evidenced. It refers to the custom of retaining a blood-stained sheet or cloth from the bed where a marriage is consummated. The blood is said to prove the bride's virginity as it evidences breaking of the hymen. In cases where the groom accused his bride of having not been a virgin at the time of the marriage, the legal responsibility for defending her rested on her parents who, by giving her in marriage, had indicated that she was qualified. The bloodstained sheet was the primary evidence brought in her defense. <clears throat> so that's what they were talking about is uh, that quote there was basically saying when when you have intercourse the first time, it causes uh, blood. There's some tearing. There's some challenges for, for the woman. And uh, that gives proof that she was a virgin, basically. Um, let's see here. There was another custom concerning the types of garments worn by unmarried women that apparently had its origin in the time of David. This would have been the long-sleeved garments that were typically worn by a young woman that declared her to be a virgin. Unmarried women did not go bare-armed. Those who did so were considered prostitutes. It is not likely that this was the evidence spoken of in the text, though. So this, that might have been later. Basically, so the, the, the thing to realize is this is talking not about if he's right if the husband's right then that's a whole nother thing what he's talking about is if the husband is wrong so if the husband falsely accuses her what has to happen and this is verse 19 here they shall immerse him a hundred shekels of silver now the word immerse means to fine basically so they're going to give they, the fine the husband a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of israel and she shall be his wife and may not put her away all his days but if this thing be, okay, so this is, if he's wrong, here's here's the thing. If he's wrong, he pays the woman's father a hundred shekels of silver for defaming his daughter. If he is, and he can't divorce her, basically. Verse 20, but if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of the father's house. The men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house so that so thou so shalt thou put evil away from among you. So if it's true, if it's found out she is not a virgin, then she's put to death. So sexual immorality is capital punishment. Capital punishment was used a lot back then. They didn't have they didn't have tolerance for a lot of these things. They're just like, nope, we're done. All right, verse 22, if a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both die, both of them die. Uh, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. Now this is, uh, it's important to understand this one. So this is if a man and a woman who are not married are having sex, they both die. If they're caught in this act, they both die. Now this if you remember, there's a woman caught in immorality during the New Testament times that the, that the Pharisees brought to the Savior to accuse her to see what he would do. This is the principle that they were quoting, that they were relying on to condemn her, basically. Verse 23, now, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to an husband and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. 
So this is saying if you have a woman who is a virgin and she is she is betrothed, meaning she is engaged to get married, uh, and she sleep with somebody else, they both die. Verse 25, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, and, and then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so this is the matter. Now it's interesting that they're putting sexual immorality is equal to murder, basically. So this is talking about somebody who has, so a damsel is out in the field, she's working, she's doing things, and a guy decides to, to rape her, basically. So it's against her will. If she goes along with it, meaning she's not crying out for help, <clears throat> then if she doesn't cry out for help, then they assume she's wanting to go along with this. So if she doesn't cry out, then she is guilty. If she does cry out, then she's innocent. Uh, verse 27, for he found her in the field and the betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her. So if she cries out and says, yes, I tried to cry out. I tried to complain, get him off me or whatever, and it didn't work, then she is not guilty at all of anything, basically. Uh, in, uh, let's see, this came from uh, the Bible commentary from Kyle and Dillich. He said, they said here, uh, in connection with the seduction of a virgin, two or really three cases are distinguished. Uh, basically, one, whether she was betrothed or not betrothed. And uh, two, if she were, were betrothed, whether it was in a town or an open field, that she had been violated by a man. If a betrothed virgin had allowed a man to have intercourse with her, they were both of them, the man and the girl, to be let out of the gate of the town and stoned that they might die. The girl, because she had not cried in the city, i.e. had not called for help, and consequently was to be regarded as consenting to the deed. The man, because he had humbled his neighbor's wife. <clears throat> the betrothed woman was placed in this respect upon a par with the married woman, and in fact is expressly called a wife in verse 24. Betrothal was the first step towards marriage, even if it was not a solemn act attested by witnesses. If, on the other hand, a man met a betrothed girl in the field and lay hold of her and lay with her, the man alone was to die, and nothing was to be done to the girl. In the open field, the girl had called the in the open field the girl had called for help, and no one had helped her. It was therefore a forcible rape. In the last case, if a virgin was not betrothed and a man seized her and lay with her, they were found or discovered, basically convicted of their deed. The man was to pay the father the fit of the girl fifty shekels of silver for the reproach brought upon him in his house, and to marry the girl whom he had humbled. <clears throat> without ever being able to divorce her. This case is similar to one mentioned in Exodus 22, 15, and 16. The omission to mention the possibility of the father refusing to give him his daughter for a wife makes no essential difference. It is assumed as self-evident here that such a right was possessed by the father. So just to finish off this chapter is what some finish off what they're talking about here. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, they be and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver. She shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. Okay, so that's the next one. So, uh, again, if, if a man rapes a woman, he has to marry her, and he can't divorce her at all. Nothing that can be done about that. So some interesting principles and laws there, not too dissimilar in some ways from what we have, but a few different unique things there they work on there. Now, verse 30 is a little different here. So a man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. What does that mean to discover his father's skirt? Uh, well, in the Old Testament study guide, it said, discovering one's skirt is a Hebrew euphemism similar to uncovering one's nakedness. See Leviticus 18, 6 or 19. And means to have sexual relations. Thus, this prohibition probably referred to a stepmother. In some cases, an older man would marry a much younger woman after the death of his first wife. 
Then, when he died, an older son, who was close to the age of his stepmother, would be tempted to marry her. The law prohibited this eventuality, as it did other cases of incest. See Leviticus 18. So you couldn't, you can't, you know, sons can't marry moms, basically. <clears throat> basically what it comes down to. So pretty interesting principles and rules that they had to look, put out there for these people to follow and obey, to help them in, to uh, not run into problems, basically. So some interesting points. If you have any comments or thoughts on what we have talked about this chapter, feel free to put them in the comments section. We'd love to hear from you there. Uh, if not, then we look forward to seeing you in the next chapter.